Hey, I'm going to lay a, a major revelation on you this morning right off the bat. All churches have. All churches have. Are you ready for this? I'm glad you're sitting down. Hold your breath. All churches have their problems. <laughs> there is no such thing, I guarantee you, as a perfect church. No, not one. If you happen to be here this morning visiting us, looking for that perfect church, I want to save you some time right now. This church is not perfect, okay? Going on record, letting you know that. In fact, it's like I've heard it said, here's my advice. If you're looking around for the perfect church and you happen to find it, don't go to it. Don't join it. It won't be perfect anymore. So that's kind of the way that goes. But you know what? I guess that's what I like about Paul's letter to the Corinthians so much. We're talking about a first century church here, folks. You know, when I think, I don't know about you, but I think about a first century church, I think, oh man, that must have been dynamite. That must have been just the coolest thing. I would love to sit in on a, on a first century church when this whole thing was just beginning. If any church was together, if any church was really spiritual and doing it right, it had to be the first century church. And you look at Corinthians and that church was filled with problems. You know, in fact, the whole letter is virtually dealing with one problem after another problem in that church. Remember when we started this study, I shared with you, I looked at one commentary. It had the whole book divided into three major sections. Section number one, divisions in the church. Section number two, disorders in the church. Section number three, difficulties in the church. I can't tell you as a pastor how much that encourages me. But you know what really encourages me even more? The fact that as Paul writes this letter, he is not discouraged about them. And he's not discouraged about that church, brethren. And he tells us right off the bat why that's the case. Right there in verse 4, back there in verse 4, he says, I thank my God always concerning you. Here's why. For the grace of God which was given to you by Jesus or by Christ Jesus. In other words, the whole reason was because of the grace of God that was given to them. Paul was very aware of what God's grace can do in a life as well as in a fellowship. And he just affirms that there in verse 9 when he says, God is faithful here. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so with that, and based upon that affirmation of the grace of God, which is right there, working in the lives of these people, regardless of the issues and problems that are going on in that church, he, in, he begins initially with a plea to them on that basis. Verse 10, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And so he actually starts with a cry that there would be unity in that body, in Jesus Christ kind of unity in that body. And he goes on and explains, because here's the problem. Verse 11, For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. That word contentions is in the Greek, erides. And it's a word that was used to describe, you might say, the, 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 the strife in a military battle that was going on. It, it describes just an in, in intense rivalry taking place there. Let me just give you an idea how serious that is spiritually. Because in Galatians, where Paul is describing the works of the flesh that actually war against the work of God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, he, he, he's listing them there in Galatians 5.20. And he says, idolatry will do that, sorcery, hatred. Notice, contentions. There's the same word. It's right in the same context as idolatry and sorcery and, and hatred. Contentions, 
he says there. That is a work of the flesh that is literally opposed to the work of God's Spirit. You know, I think a lot of times it's like Paul, when he was Saul, had this sense right there in, in the beginning of the book of the Acts when, when he's introduced, that he, was, he felt he was standing for God when he was actually directly opposed to what God was desiring to do and what God was doing there. And I think that attitude can actually be in the body of Christ when there's these kinds of contentions that leads to division. Notice he said, there, there now is because of those contentions, there's divisions in the body. Schemata is the work in the Greek. It's the word we get our word schism from. And it means literally to tear apart. And, and the point is that the difference of opinion going on there is it, it's literally, literally separating the body of Christ. Sort of puts you in, in one camp as opposed to those that are in another, another camp. And this is happening right there in the body of Christ, which has been unified by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And, and that's going on there. You know, it's sad enough when that very thing has led to so many denominations. I mean, I, I remember years ago, I was going into the bank, and one of the other pastors of just a fine little Christian fellowship in the community at the time was coming out, and I saw him, and I said, hey, bro, man, I see you, you know, and I just walked on into the bank, and when I got up to the teller, the teller said, oh, hello, Pastor Brian. Hey, your competition was just in here. You know what I wish I would have said? I thought of it right after. It's one of those things where, oh, I wish I would have thought of that then. I wish I would have, when she said that, I would have looked around and said, are you kidding me? Satan was just in here? I don't remember what I said. But you know what? It's especially tragic when that kind of a spirit invades a local body of believers. That is so destructive to what God wants to do. I see three things that does to a body. Three things. Number one, it hurts the body. Just flat out hurts the body. You know why? When there's contention and division, suddenly the ministry of the Holy Spirit is being quenched in that body, especially in this way. When you've got somebody maybe you've got a little contention, a little division with or something like that, you can no longer receive the ministry of the Holy Spirit through that person into your life. It's been cut off. You won't receive it. And so there's a breakdown of the ministry of the Holy Spirit going on in the body. I have literally seen that as a pastor. Somebody maybe will get miffed, they'll get a burr under their saddle because of something I said or something I did. And so suddenly, you know, this is their church. They come to church, but I can see it. I can see it in the crossing of the arms and the looking down and, 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 and their eyes that they're not receiving a thing I'm sharing that Sunday morning. And the sad thing about that is I'm not, I'm not up here trying to, trying to convince anybody of anything that's coming off the top of my head. I'm just taking the Word of God here and trying to share it openly. This is what the Word of God is saying, and now they can't receive it. Because of an attitude, divisive attitude, contention or something like that. It hurts the church. And you know who it really hurts? Really hurts? It's the new believers. The new believers come into a body. They're excited about their newfound faith. They're excited about, about the fellowship of believers. They'd never experienced anything like that before. And if they get into a body and suddenly they're hearing gossip and they're seeing strife and they're seeing rivalry, it just hurts them most deeply because they least expected something like that in a place like this where people are exalting the name of Jesus Christ and rejoicing in our faith in him. And sometimes, and you have seen it, you had new believers just falling away and leaving and never returning. Now, maybe that would have happened anyway. But I hate to think that we actually helped it to happen. It hurts the body of Christ, brethren. Here's the second thing it does. It destroys that body's witness in the community. You know, um, Jesus said, John 13, 35, by this, will, by this all will know that you are my disciples 
if you have love for one another. That's our witness to the community. In his, in his great prayer in John 17, 23, he said, he's praying, I in them and you in me that they, the body, my believers, might be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. What a prayer. But you know what? It's, it's that's contentions and divisions that... That witness in the world is just so corrupted. I remember reading years ago about a, about a church that was having a big, big argument, you know, and contention over the color of the carpet in their new sanctuary. And the local newspaper got wind of that and began to write little articles. Hey, here's what's going on at the local church now, you know, about this. And, and the, it was sort of like a community soap opera, you know, People were reading about that. And that church ended up just being split right down the middle over the color of the carpet in the sanctuary. And instead of being a witness in that community, they had become a laughing stock in that community. Brethren, those contentions destroy the witness of that fellowship in the community. And of course, and thirdly, it dishonors God, doesn't it? It really dishonors God. You're his child, I'm his child, they're his child. And now there's all that division and contention. We are, are called to be that light in the world, uh, uh, showing forth the glory of God and the love of God. You know, like Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And this just really dims that. I, early on in my ministry, I remember having a very vivid dream at one point. And in this dream, there was this broad path, you know, it was sort of, it, it had to be that broad path that Jesus said leads to destruction because it was a very broad path and it was leading to destruction. In fact, there was a precipice down there and people were falling off of it. And it was jammed full of people. I mean, it was just this wide path jammed full of people. Just, just, just walking down that path, I have no idea, most of them, that they were heading toward a precipice and people were falling off. And there were, the, there were Christians on the side of that broad path and, and, and they were there to call out to those people, uh, to warn them and urge them off that path and even help them off that path if they could. That's what they were there for, you know. And, and as I took a closer look in my dream, you know what I saw? The Christians weren't doing that. They were arguing with each other. And Paul is saying here, the Lord is saying, brethren, that not ought to be. And so he says there in verse 10, I now plead with you. And he wouldn't do this if it wasn't necessary. Brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. In other words, do everything you can. Strive for, doggedly guard a true spirit of unity in the Lord, in a body. Because there's an enemy out there that desires to foment division in the body. It's exactly what he wants to see happen in the body, to nullify its effectiveness. And so Paul's admonition here, the Lord's admonition, by all means, be an instrument of unity in the body. And you go, well, how, how do you do that? Well, I've got four suggestions for you. Number one, these are pretty simple. This will really help. Number one, do not pass on gossip. Start there. Do not pass on gossip. In other words, I'm not going to say anything about anyone or even anything that's in any way divisive to anyone except maybe the person that is directly related to it. I'll talk to them. But I'm not going to say anything to anybody else. Gossip's going to stop right here. You know what that includes? Because I think we don't feel like we're gossiping when we have a very close friend in the body and I'll just share this with them. That's gossip. It's going to stop right here. I, I'm not going to pass on gossip in the body because it can cause contention and divisiveness in the body, and I don't want to do that. I want to do everything I can to bring unity in the body. You know, the Bible says love covers a multitude of sin. Secondly, just flat out submit to the leadership of the body, and here's the key in that. 
with your trust in the Lord. We're not perfect. With your trust in the Lord, submit to the leadership. Now, the writer of Hebrews, which may have been Paul, puts it very clearly in, in, in Hebrews 13, 17. Obey those who rule over you. He's talking about the body, the church. And be submissive, for they watch out for your souls that as those who must give an account, let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Just let them lead. And I know, Brian, what if they're flat off off the wall? What if they're just flat out out there and they're just not going to listen? They're not listening to anybody. What are you to do? You know, I like what Proverbs 21.1 says. The king's heart, and that would be anybody in a place of authority, right up to the king. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And like rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. Those rivers of water really more correctly, channels of water. It's, it's descriptive of irrigation channels. And we're just going to open up this channel. We're going to turn the water down there to, to water this field, you know? And the point about it is God can change a heart. God can do what God needs to do in anybody's heart. Anybody in a place of leadership. He can remove that leadership if need be. And so, you know, with your trust in the Lord, just, just submit to that leadership. Thirdly, pray for one another. Pray for one another. You know, in that same context where we're told, submit to those in authority over you, they look out for your souls. Very next verse, 1318 of Hebrews, pray for us, for we, have con we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things, desiring to live honorably. You know what he's saying? Would you pray for us? We're doing our best. We're not perfect, but we're doing the best we can. Pray for us. Pray for one another. I remember a little book that came out years ago by a pastor's wife, and the whole book was built on this premise. On their Sunday evening service, they would have sharing and like that, and she would be sit in the back there, and people would get up and share in the body, and she knew these people. She knew them pretty well. It was kind of one of those kind of small, intimate churches where people knew people, and they'd get up and say things, you know, like that, and in her heart, she was going, you hypocrite, because she knew what was going on. They're like, what a hypocrite, and she was sitting back there just being, you know, critical of everybody and feeling like, what a bunch of hypocrites. And the Lord just laid on her heart, why are you doing that? Pray for them. And she made it her mission. It went, oh yeah, I should do that. Her mission. Especially if to when she was in the back of the church on Sunday evening and she saw the backs of those heads of just looking at the back of that head and just praying for that person in the Lord. And as a result, when that began to happen, some of the spiritual things she saw going on in that church was such a, a mind blower to her. She said, God, you're awesome. You led me to do that. And I see without me getting up there and doing anything myself, but just being in prayer for these people, you're doing a great work here. And she, it's so much so she wrote a book about it. Brethren, pray for one another. And then fourthly, and I'm taking it from Philippians 2, 2 and 3. It goes like this. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. And I would put it this way. Surrender your self-will. You just don't have to have your way. And I'll tell you something. Self-will will always get you into trouble. And it is the cause of so much division. As sure as I'm standing here, it's divisive in nature. So cloak yourself in humility and say, Lord, I can... I'm going to esteem others better than myself and just see what you want to do here. So brethren, don't pass on gossip. Submit to the, lead, the, the leadership with your trust in the Lord.
pray for one another and surrender yourself well. And this sets the context for God to do that wonderful work of grace in the body. Because he said at the end of verse 10, but that you may be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And that perfectly joined together or made complete, as another version puts it, is descriptive of an outside work of God going on in which you cooperate. But it's God's work. It's what God's doing. And the point is, brethren, as we stand against divisions and contentions in the body, Lord, let me be an instrument of unity here. God does a beautiful work of His grace. Healing. Healing and bonding. And what a beautiful work of God that is. And so, brethren, there's the plea. And then he goes on from there, and he shows us where divisions come from. In verse 12, now I say this, and here's, the, here's where those divisions are coming from, those contentions, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. You see, brethren, this is what happens when people see the ministry or the church primarily as a work of men rather than a work of God. I can almost see what's happening here. There's those who say, I am of Paul. You know, Paul was the beloved first pastor of that church there in Corinth, there for a year and a half establishing it. And he brought the gospel of grace to those people. And they got set free in Christ. And he what was so, so affirmative of that grace and the liberty that we have in Jesus Christ. And there were those early members that, that joined that church when Paul was pastoring it that just, you know, that, that they remembered the way it was. And it was like, let's preserve that. Let's preserve that spirit. I love it. And then there were those who were of Apollos. Apollos actually was the second pastor of that church. He was a man who came from, we know from Scripture, Alexandria. Egypt. Let me tell you about Alexandria in that day. It was the learning capital of the Roman Empire. It had the largest library in the world right there in Alexandria. And we, we can see from Apollo that he was a very learned and cultured man. He was articulate. He was a gifted speaker. No one could out-debate Apollos. He was eloquent and he brought an intelligence and a sophistication to the ministry there. And I think it was probably, if you, know what, if you know what I mean, kind of the BMW crowd that really loved this guy, you know? And then there were those who were of Cephas. Now, that's Peter. You might say they were sort of the, maybe, maybe the traditionalist crowd. They loved Peter. Peter was the guy that walked with Jesus. He's the only one listed that actually walked with Jesus in his ministry. We all just love Peter. You know, good old Peter. He might have been the, the, the SUV uh, uh, pickup truck crowd. I just love this guy. And, you know, there was some of that, some of that Jewish flavor to, to Peter's ministry and everything, you know, that it, its roots in Judaism and like that. That just was, oh, I like that. And, uh, you know, probably a group that said, this is the way it should be. And... <clears throat> And others may have looked at that and said, eh, they can tend to be a little legalistic. You know? And then there was the we're of Christ crowd. <laughs> These I would dub the super spirituals. You know, we have a relationship with the Lord that's just closer and deeper than you folks. In fact, we don't need human instruction, human teaching, Human help, uh-uh. This is the gang that probably would go around and every other, every other sentence would be, oh, the Lord told me. God told me this. God told me that. And they just felt that they had, they had such a close relationship with God. And they sort of looked around at the other believers because they didn't have the, that close relationship that they had with the Lord. It was one of those things where if you doubted that, just ask them. They'll do everything they can to make it clear to you that, their relationship with him is just a little more spiritual than yours. They have a connection with God that hey, you don't have. We're of Christ. You see, Paul puts it in the same 
category as Paul, Apollos, and Cephas. And brethren, the result is contentions leading to divisions in the body. And I, I think the problem here, when you come right down to it, is a discrediting of God and his faithfulness to the body to do a good work in others. That this is God's work and he can do it. I see two destructive attitudes here. One is, it's sort of uh, against the other's attitude. In other words, you know what the problem here is? It's not that they have differences of opinions about things. That's really not the issue. I, I mean, we all will. The problem is, the, the divisive attitude they harbor toward others because of that. You know, a lot of times people, if they're part of one little group or something like this, they've got to justify why they're part of that group. Why, I've chosen this group, and this is, what I, this is what I feel. And you know how most of us, or I should say at least a lot of people, justify why they're a part of a particular group? By pointing out and criticizing what's wrong with the other groups that makes them right on being a part of that group. And that whole attitude brings contentions and divisions to the body. So there's a against the others kind of an attitude there. And then secondly, their eyes are on men in a situation like this, as though it's the man. It's all about the people, the man, what he does, how he does it, the style he uses. It's what's going to either make or break the work of God. Oh, that's so ludicrous, you know? And so they're inadvertently seeing the church as primarily a human enterprise rather than the work of God himself. You know, that attitude, he's just going to ruin everything, you know? Maybe his, his, his heart is right and his doctrine is pure. He's going to ruin everything. Oh, we need this other guy in here. He'll make everything better. You know, with him, yeah, it'll happen. No, 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 no. I like that. I just saw it. it. It was getting passed around the internet here. God can use anyone. Listen to this. Jacob was a cheater. Peter had a temper. David had an affair. Noah got drunk. Jonah ran from God. Paul was a murderer. Gideon was in, insecure. Miriam was a gossiper. Martha was a worrier. Thomas was a doubter. Sarah was impatient. Elijah was depressed. Moses stuttered. Zacchaeus was short. Abraham was old. And Lazarus was dead. <laughs> God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And so, brethren, the living church is his work. And you focus on the man. That is the source of quarrels and divisions. So then he finally just points out to us the way of spiritual unity. And so he goes on and says in verse 13, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. You can almost see Paul going, oh yeah. I, uh, besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. Here's his point. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. The gospel is Jesus Christ, crucified for you, risen and living, Lord and Savior. Put your trust and faith in him. Period. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. This is a work of God, not man's ability. You see? I see two, two, two things he's talking about where your focus ought not to be and ought to be. Number one, Get your focus off the man in this work. You see what Paul is saying here? It's not about me. It's not about me. 
Brethren, I don't care who the person is. I don't care how mightily he's been used. Get him off any kind of pedestal. You know, the higher the pedestal, the greater the fall. And that's inevitably what will happen because you're talking people. Barnabas and, and Paul understood this so well. When they were in Lystra and, and there was a big crowd gathered and this, this lame guy uh, got instantly healed through their ministry, the crowd went bonkers. And they thought, uh, you know, the gods had come in their midst and they, and they were bringing an, an oxen and garlands and they wanted to sacrifice it to Paul and Barnabas. And when Paul and Barnabas got wind of what was going on there, the Bible says they ran through the crowd and now grab this, they tore their clothes, they, their garments, they just tore them in agony and said, stop this, stop this, stop this. And here's what they said, we are men of like nature as you. There's no difference between you and us. And, we're, and we're, all we're doing is crying out to you to, to cease from these kinds of things and turn to the living God who created heaven and earth. It's about him. And so, get your focus off men. And I'm serious. And then what is coupled with that and goes with it and what Paul is pointing to here, put your focus squarely on Jesus Christ and Him crucified as Lord and Savior. It's about Him. It's not about any man. This work is not about any man. It's about Him. Period. And so, He is the one who has saved each one of us. He's the one that's done that. And consequently, He is the one that is building His church and doing through the Holy Spirit the works of God for His glory, for the glory of God. It's all a work of the Lord's. All through Acts, you just read, where you read, and the Lord added to the church. The Lord, in a dream, said to Paul in Corinth, I have many people in this city. Stay here and preach. Because it's His work. And what is, what, you know, how do we relate to that? I love the way he puts it in Philippians 2 when he says, um, verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. It's all his plan and it's all his work for his good pleasure. That's what's going on here, brethren. And so you see, the glory is not to Paul, and it's not to Apollos, and it's not to Cephas, and it's not to Chuck Smith, and it's not to any dork named Brian anywhere in the world. But all the glory is to Jesus Christ. It's, it's Him. Unless we think sometimes we're getting God figured out. I know what God's doing. Let me remind you that Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 55, and I notice I didn't put it down, but it's a good one. I want to read it to you. Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9 says this, For my thoughts, this is the Lord speaking, are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your thoughts ways, says the Lord. Lest you think you might have God figured out in what he's doing here. He reminds us of that. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know, it's like, I remember hearing Chuck Smith saying when Calvary Chapel was just booming so incredibly that it was in, in Time magazine. His whole comment was, look what the Lord is doing. He couldn't, put his, he couldn't put a hand on it. Look what the Lord is doing. And I love what Paul says in, in Romans 11.33, when he can, just considers all these things. He says, oh, the depth of the riches of both the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Oh, Look what the Lord has done. He's always surprising me. 
So Paul sums up this thought actually in chapter 3. If you want to look over in chapter 3, at verse, at verse 4. In my Bible, it's one page over. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Are you not thinking just in a fleshly way? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, or he who waters, but God who gives the increase. So brethren, get your focus off the man and onto Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so, any church that's worth its salt, no pun intended, you know, salt of the earth, worth its salt. It's not a pun. Just Satan will try to divide and conquer. We can expect it. And so, in this letter, Paul's first admonition to these people Verse 10, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Just like he says in Ephesians, and I close with this, Ephesians 4, 1 to 3, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling to which you were called. Here it is, in all lowliness and gentleness, in long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So, love one another and so fulfill the law of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time we've had together. And Lord, knowing how there is a living enemy out there that, that, that just feverishly works to sow discord in the body of Christ. Father, I pray against that in the name of Jesus Christ. And I pray, Father, that we would be instruments of, of the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, which is in Jesus Christ, our Lord, and through His living Word. Let it be in His name. Amen. Amen. Amen.